Oral History Project. I'm interviewing Steve Gunderson at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. It's um, August 16th, 2005, and I'm Hannah Nordhaus. Uh, so Steve, uh, to start, if you could just tell me a little bit about your background, where you grew up, what your parents did, how you no. ended up, and okay, I, you are. I'm uh, originally from um, northeast Iowa. I was born there and moved to uh, Davenport, Iowa, which is the Quad Cities. On the eastern along the Mississippi River when I was seven. Went to high school in Davenport. I did my undergraduate college uh, work at um, Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois. I graduated as a geologist. Did my graduate work at the University of California at Berkeley um, and I uh, also in geology. Uh, got a master's of science degree there. Went to um, work in the oil business here in um, Denver uh, started at a, at, with a small independent, or a, I'm sorry, a major company, Mobile Oil. Was, wasn't there very long, went to a small independent that was a public traded company uh, as, and then basically got laid off in the late 80s. Um, hadn't been in the oil business very long. It was basically when the oil business was kind of plummeting. Uh, came to the health department as a geologist in 1989, working in the hazardous materials and waste management division. In 1992, I was, uh, became, um, my, I took my first management position in the health department, um, which was managing the uh, emergency management program, the department's emergency response activities to hazardous uh, materials spills, um, also dealing with emergency preparedness related to um, an offsite emergency at Rocky Flats, as well as uh, nuclear materials shipments, such as uh, shipments of transuranic waste to WIP that were in the planning stages then. In January of 1998, I became the Rocky Flats Project Coordinator, which basically I was responsible for managing the state's uh, regulatory oversight of Rocky Flats under the Rocky Flats Cleanup Agreement. And I served in that capacity until mid-July of this year. And uh, presently, I'm the uh, Director of the Water Quality Control Division. So um, in your capacity as manager of Rocky Flats Oversight, were you on site there? We, um, I was off, up there often. Um, most of the time, I had staff who worked up there all the time. You met Ed Cray, he basically officed up there. I had other staff who did too, particularly those people who worked in the buildings. I had some staff who spent a large chunk of their time um, here, but were up at the site usually a few days a week. Um, I'd go up there when DOE's offices were there. I mean, usually the most toxic thing I did was meetings, um, but, and I did lots of those. I, I, you know, I got in the buildings, but my, I was in more of a managerial position in a, as a negotiator, basically, working with the counterpart signatories to the cleanup agreement, what we call RIFCA. Um, and then when uh, DOE's offices were moved off-site to their Mountain View facility near the Jefferson County Airport, my uh, frequency visiting Rocky Flats diminished accordingly, and I'd go, instead of being there a couple times a week, I might be there once every two or three weeks. So uh, I, a lot of, I mean, I, my office, I did not, never had an office there. I'd sometimes show up in the CDPAT offices, usually, which were in a trailer, um, kind of moved around in different trailers, and I'd hang out there to handle phone calls, but I didn't just hang out there, um, usually. Um, a lot of my meetings weren't at, at, at Rocky Flats, they'd be either at EPA or um, man, the majority of them were in the uh, communities, uh, Westminster, Broomfield, Arvada. Okay. Um, so when did you first become aware of Rocky Flats? Well, I, I certainly heard about Rocky Flats in the 80s. Didn't know much about it. I, I recalled, uh, you know, when I was for, you know, shortly after I moved here, they had the thing where they tried to have, uh, you know, circle around Rocky Flats, you know, and uh, I think they missed it by a mile and a half of having everyone hold their hands all the way around it. So I knew of its existence in the 80s, didn't know much about it, didn't think much about it. Certainly heard about the FBI raid in 1989, just before I came to work in the health department. Uh, in 89, when I came here, I started getting more familiar with Rocky Flats because it was in, um, I was in the Hazardous Materials and Waste Management Division, which had a big role in, in uh, regulatory issues at Rocky Flats and a very contentious one with that. 
relationship between the Department of Energy and the State Health Department wasn't very good. Um, the first time I first got involved in Rocky Flats is I participated in a Rocky Flats emergency exercise that was a full-scale exercise involving state and local government. And I played a role, I can't remember what that role really was, it was a fairly low-level role at the health department dealing with the uh, responding to calls and that type of stuff. I don't recall the exercise going that well. Um, you know, um, they, you know, some, you know, you always find problems in an emergency exercise and that's why you do exercises. And this one, they found lots of problems. Um, the first time I went to Rocky Flats, I, um, I, I went to Rocky Flats twice um, before I ever had a, a where, where my job actually involved Rocky Flats responsibilities. One was uh, in uh, about the third week, second or third week of June when we had a heat wave in 1990. Um, there, there was an emergency planning zone committee meeting that was looking um, at the request of Governor Romer and Al Hazel was part of this, um, where they were looking at what was called the maximum credible accident. Shortly, uh, that in the late 80s, I think 1988, Governor Cecil Andrus of Idaho blocked additional shipments of radioactive waste um, to Idaho, uh, what is now Idaho National Labs outside of Great Falls, Idaho, Idaho Falls, Idaho rather. Um, he blocked those shipments and uh, so suddenly the stuff couldn't go anywhere and it was being piled up at Rocky Flats and Governor Romer asked, how does that change the risk of a, an accident? What does that change the maximum credible accident? So they created this team of, of uh, both site experts and state experts, Al Hazel being a primary factor, Dick Fox also, he was in our AIR program, to look at this evaluating the risks of Rocky Flats. Are the risks changing? And um, in 1990, they went and did a tour of the inside of the site, including going into the protected area where the plutonium was, to look at how, where the, chemicals were stored. I mean large tank chemical tanks like nitric acid tanks, hydrofluoric acid tanks, carbon tetrachloride tanks, that type of stuff. Um, and I went, um, my supervisor at the time, I was getting involved in the emergency response stuff at that time in the hazardous materials division and I got, said do you want to go on this trip? And I said sure. So I went on the bus and we actually, I wasn't, I didn't even have a Rocky Flats badge, we actually were escorted, but the bus went into the protected area and we got to look at this stuff. And then several months later, it might have been 1991, in the, uh, in, in fact, I, I noticed that uh, a couple years ago, Kaiser Hill made a 50 year history book, a timeline of the history of Rocky Flats. And this, this episode was listed in there where at that time, Rocky Flats was trying to get they're, they've been shut down by the FBI EPA raid in 1989 and they were trying to get jump started to get start building they're doing their nuclear processing work and they were doing this operational readiness review stuff and as part of that they were trying to get building 559 which was their plutonium lab up and running and they decided to invite the media to go see this plutonium lab and I Someone again in the department said, hey, you want to go on this? And I said, sure. So we got to go into building 559 in the protected area. And I, I didn't know much about Rocky Flats, but I, I went on that tour. And as I mentioned, the Cold War, uh, that the history of Rocky Flats timeline lists that event as the first time the media ever were invited in the protected area at Rocky Flats. And I just happened to be on that tour. I remember Mark Roberts worked for... Uh, uh, Colorado Public Radio at the time and he was sitting next to me in the bus and he asked if I, he could interview me and I declined just because I I was going along for the ride like he was. I didn't know much about the site then. Um, so then I, I uh, Rocky Flats officially became part of my responsibilities in January of 92 when um, I started managing the department, uh, created a, an emergency management unit or emergency management program. And one of our functions was planning and emergency preparedness related to Rocky Flats. And that's when I got my first site access badge. 
first link was just an access badge, not a security clearance. And I started getting involved in Rocky Flat stuff from an emergency perspective, which was a big deal back then. You know, the, go ahead. Oh, I'm just wondering if that this, you said this is the first, the, this was a new department, the em emergency? It was a new, new unit in this department. Okay. And, and was, had there been emergency preparedness planning for Rocky Flats? Oh, yes. Flats oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, but what had happened, it's a convoluted story, but there had been a, a, a state agency called the Division of Disaster Emergency Services, which was in the State Department of Public Safety. And uh, they had a state emergency operations center, which until recently was in a bunker out at Camp George West in Golden. They've just built a new facility somewhere in South Metro area. Uh, but um, the, the responsibilities of state emergency planning preparedness were housed out of that depart division in Department of Public Safety, including for Rocky Flats. Beginning in 1989, after the FBI raid, there was an agreement and principle signed with the Governor Romer and the Department of Energy that gave the state funding for various regulatory oversight activities and emergency preparedness activities. That money came to this department and then the emergency preparedness money was funneled to public safety. What happened is in June of 1990, there was the Lyman tornado that leveled parts of the town of Lyman. The governor responded, was disappointed with the performance of the Division of Disaster Emergency Services. And um, in 1991, he announced the dissolution of that agency, moved the FEMA-funded programs to the Department of Local Affairs, which became the Office of Emergency Management, which is an office that exists today. The DOE-funded programs, which uh, included emergency preparedness related to Rocky Flats and uh, emergency preparedness related to shipments of radioactive waste to WIP. They were trying to get that going. And so that was one of the issues, is getting first response communities along the routes comfortable with what these things were and what they weren't. And, and uh, so they were funding a program through the Western Governors Association, and they were funding State of Colorado participation in that. Those two programs state, went to the Health Department, stayed at the Health Department. And so in January of 92, I was put in charge of that unit and in those two programs. And as part of that, then, I started getting involved in the DOE stuff from an emergency preparedness perspective. And uh, at that time, um, Rocky Flats had been shut down um, in uh, the FBI raid. And they, as I'm sure you know, when the site was shut down, there was no pre-planning. It just happened one morning. And so you had all these hazardous chemicals and radioactive chemicals, caustic chemicals in pipes, uh, radioactive acids in tanks. Um, designed and in uh, materials in containers that were not designed for long-term storage. It was just left, basically, the, the, the site was put on the skids immediately with no pre-planning. And uh, so emergency preparedness was a big deal. And, um, you know, I happened to be up at the site on the afternoon when the fir first President Bush announced that he was discontinuing production of a uh, nuclear uh, missile for um, submarines. And with that announcement, it was announced over the speakerphones at Rocky Flats that if he had gone ahead and authorized the construction of those we weapons, Rocky Flats would have had a reason to continue the, its mission. When President Bush Sr. Uh, decided not to continue that operation, to suspend that production, Rocky Flats had no mission. And so I happened to be on the day when it, up at the site where the speakerphone went on and they said this was discontinued and everyone knew suddenly Rocky Flats no longer was in the business of making nukes. But the risks were very real. At that time, Rocky Flats had more plutonium than any other site in North America. It had all this material in these very unsafe configurations. And uh, in 2000, 1994, the Department of Energy released a, what was called the Plutonium Vulnerability Study. And Ed Cray, who you've interviewed, was participated in that study. 
and it was front page headline news in all the news outlets in the Denver metro area when that came out because it listed the most dangerous buildings in the Department of Energy complex and five of the top ten were at Rocky Flats including number one and number two. Number one was building 771, 774. Number two was 776, 777. And this is, a, again, at a time when I dealt with state emergency preparedness related to Rocky Flats, so it was a big deal. And, uh, you know, we, had, we would conduct emergency planning. We revised the state's the radiological emergency response plan for Rocky Flats. We conducted emergency planning. And then we, we had participated and had Rocky Flats exercises where the state would participate in the exercise and they would simulate some type of accident up there that would cause a release and we'd have to go through this emergency system. It was a, it was a you know, a one couple exercises, we had a couple hundred state and local people participate. Um, we would simulate public information briefings, you know, with simulated press and we would go through this whole thing um, for uh, a, a possible, low risk, but possible catastrophic accident, Rocky Flats, like a fire and a release of plutonium to the atmosphere. Fortunately, we never had to do that in reality. We had ex emergencies, but they were all relatively small. You know, um, you know, I remember one, a propane truck tipping over in the protected area. A uh, water main bus where it filled up in water entered rooms where plutonium was being stored. Um, had a case, uh, the, the biggest one was what they called a site area emergency where they were doing some of their first environmental remediation work. Um, this would have been about 1995. They um, had uh, uh, working in Trench 3 and Trench 4 where they were crushing drums and they, turns out one of the drums had depleted uranium and they, you know, because it was kind of a release in the environment, they called a site area emergency. So we, but it was not, it was, it was a small release and it was confined to the immediate proximity of the area. So fortunately we never had a big one. What was, what was like your great fear as what a big one would have been? Well, I will tell you that even then I thought the risks of a catastrophic accident were probably pretty small, even when I was involved in it, but it wasn't zero. Um, as you know, that historically there have been some very serious accidents at Rocky Flats. Two major fires in two buildings, one in 57, one in 1969. The Mother's Day 1969 fire was the largest U.S. fire, fire, industrial fire in United States history up to that point. And had the roof of that building collapsed, it was damaged by the fire, but it did not collapse. The firefighters put the, were successful in putting the fire out but had it collapsed we would have had a catastrophe. Um, even though we had all that weapons grade plutonium and uh, nuclear, all other sorts of nuclear materials stored in, in, in um, plutonium uh, liquids and stuff stored in unsafe configuration, um, the, the, the conditions of the site in the early 90s were quite different than the site in the late 60s. The, the main difference was that in the 60s, the glove boxes where they did all the work had just normal atmosphere in them. And plutonium can burn. It's pyrophoric. It burns like charcoal. And that's what led to the events of the fire. After the 80s, um, after, I mean, after that fire, the, the glove boxes were converted to ha be, have inert air, nitrogen. If I remember, it was, ni yeah, it was nitrogen. And uh, that way, you, you didn't create a pyrophoric environment. You know, there was, you know, there was a potential if we had had a plane crash into it, like say from the Jefferson County Airport, that could have been something. We were much more worried in terms of not, the risk wasn't so great. We thought to uh, off-site populace, like if they'd had the roof collapse in 776 in 1969. That could have caused off-site serious off-site consequences. Plutonium could have gone in, up into the air and then been deposited in the Denver metro area. But the risk in the 90s to the workers was very real. Um, Rocky Flats was listed as a great risk of a, a criticality incident, where a workers would get nearby could be fatally 
killed by a sudden dose of, uh, of intense radioactivity. Um, there were a couple close calls where some workers weren't following procedures. In fact, it led to some terminations of some workers who had emptied uh, a tank improperly. Um, so that was a big worry, and we would communicate to the site, look, even if you have something that didn't result in an off-site consequence, given the public's perceptions uh, and fears of Iraqi flats, given the media's great scrutiny, if they had an accident that affected some workers at Rocky Flats and either hurt or killed them, it would still be a huge issue for the state of Colorado. I mean, it, you know, because we there would be a huge amount of, um, of, of media and public concern, uh, adverse media and public concern. But fortunately, we didn't have that either. You know, we, you know the work is almost done there. And uh, they've been very lucky. I mean, they've had some close calls, but they've never had some in the last, uh, certainly since I've been involved at Rocky Flats, they've never had any um, serious injury or fatality. Still could happen, but they don't have much time left. I'd say they're going to they're gonna dodge that bullet. Um, how much control as, as a state regulator did you have over, you know, if you said, look, the, look at the, this perception will be bad if something happens, we need to control this. Did they listen to you, or did, did you have any power over that? I would say it evolved. Um, when you were in state emergency preparedness, dealing with emergency preparedness, you had no regular, you weren't a regulator. Mm -hmm. Your job was planning preparedness for an incident, so you would work with them. They would provide funding for you to do your job, um, you know, federal funding, um, because it was their responsibility. But it's like we could we would gum them to death. You you did had no teeth. Um, you um, uh, you um, you were responsible, and you would remind them all the time that it was if they had a release with offsite consequences that that they had no control there. It was the state who had the authority. So if we'd had an accident, we had the authority under our, the radi state's Radiation Control Act to deal appropriately to respond to an emergency. If it left, the, if, if, the, if, if it, it was radioactive yeah, they, off-site. Yeah, they, basically emergencies were divided into three categories. There was an alert, which basically means there was, well, there were actually a couple smaller categories, but the three emergencies were an alert, which is something like an, an, an abnormal incident that created an emergency situation but no release out of a building, or sometimes no release even in a building. That would be like a propane truck tipping over, or the, um, we had one where there was a release of a tank failed containing hydrochloric acid, but it contained in the uh, a, um, waste, a water processing building, uh, building 891, and it basically was contained in a berm that was around the tank. That was an alert. Water main break going into a plutonium area. That was an alert. Power outage, big serious power outage could be an alert. Site area emergency was an incident where there could be a release, but it was retained on site. General emergency is where it's a release that either had the potential or impacted off-site areas. Once it got off-site, that's state control, you know. So, but as a regular, once I became a regulator, where I was responsible for ensuring that the cleanup was conducted according to regulation, then I debt had a lot of teeth. You know, we often argued over how big my teeth were, but as, as things evolved, by the end of this cleanup, um, you know, virtually everything had to be done by, you know, under uh, our approval as regulators. Um, and that's, that's a long, that's a separate story than other my early years, but one of the big battles that we've had, had with the federal government that we were able to iron out for the most part was how, how, you know, how, how we controlled what they did without basically um, constipated, <laughs> that's not the best word I'm looking for, but hamstrung their ability to get work done because regulators can really be a bottleneck. And you know, we there was a great interest. You know, there was huge money, federal money being thrown at this cleanup. So there was great interest to get results. You know, because if if they didn't get results, Congress would get fickle about funding. So, but at least in the emergency response, I was not. I did not serve as as the role of a regulator.
and I, I served in that capacity through 1997. So, um, how did you feel? How, how was their emergency preparedness when you came onto the job? Did you feel that comfortable with? Um, the the biggest problem in emergencies is always communication glitches. In a, in a real emergency, look at what happened with the September 11th stuff and how they're trying to sort out what, uh, just this past few days, releasing all the transcripts of uh, of uh, radio chatter during the the events at the World Trade Center. Uh, you know, communication is always a problem. So they would drop the ball on communication. We would drop the ball. There would be disconnects during drills and exercises, or even during real emergencies. Things weren't didn't follow out, and you'd learn from them and you correct mistakes. Um, but they took emergency stuff pretty seriously. They um, you know, they had their own on-site fire department until the end of June, when it was uh, shut down this year. They had a uh, it's an emergency operations center in, on the center of the site, which was that back in those days we, I viewed it as state of the art. Certainly, far better than our 1960s civil defense state emergency operations center in the bunker at Camp George West. You know, um, they they did. You know, they worked on it seriously. That doesn't mean it wasn't perfect. Uh, was perfect because it certainly wasn't. And one of their problems was that if they did have a serious release on site, say after hours, and your emergency operations center is in the center of the site, how do you get to it? Well, you couldn't. And even if you could get to it, it didn't have filter systems. You know, if you had a release in the air, there was no way that your emergency operations center was protected by a filtration system. So they set up an alternate emergency operations center at the federal center at the FEMA offices in the event they couldn't use the, the one on site. Never had to, never, that never became a reality. But, so, you know, it wasn't perfect, but they certainly put some effort to it. What, what would you do when you described it as state of the art compared to the bunker? What, what? It was, it had nice furniture, it had computers. Of course, computers are far more sophisticated now than they were in the early 90s. They had these giant screens that would show, um, of the site that would show what's going on. Uh, intercom systems connecting between the two. Um, sometimes they, you know, sometimes it, the, their system would become too complicated. I mean, the more complicated something can be, the more likely someone's going to screw it up, especially when it's complicated for people. And so they would work to try to streamline and simplify some of that complexity, and that was helpful. But um, you know, they, they, you know, it it looked, um, uh, you know. It, it it was it was uh, you know they had a crisis management team room designated where you had all the players earmarked that if you went into an emergency you had we had a health department wrap there and you had a spot health department and, and assigned seat assigned seat and you'd have a phone and then you had it was divided into th three groups there was the crisis management team which was where the decision makers would sit in that room. And then you had another room, what was called the Hazard Assessment Center, the technical people who would, would assess the so what, what was the hazard and what was the con potential consequences from that hazard based on what they knew. And then you had a crisis support team, which was basically doing the legwork to support everything that's going on. And then, of course, you had your fire department or your response team that would go out to the site, the place where the emergency occurred was occurring and they would form an incident command that would interface with the emergency operations center. So they had this whole system laid out. Um, and um, you know it, it it generally I think worked fairly well. We we ended up took some adjustment but we ended up playing an important a key role in that. I, I think you know one of the challenges um, to it, it, this is coming up in my conversation, so I, it, I'm kind of sound like I'm jumping. But one of the challenges that uh, we as outsiders had in Rocky Flats was dealing with what I called, and I'm the only person who used this term, the Jonestown mentality. You remember Jonestown in Guyana? The fee that at that time there was this great fear of outsiders, and when you as an outsider went to Rocky Flats in the early '90s, that's how I described it. 
you go into something and there was a great suspicion of you. I mean, that nuke-making mentality. You were an outsider, therefore you were a tree hugger or whatever, and you were the enemy. Us versus them. And we played that too. They were the enemy. And so you go into a meeting on site and there may be two of you and a hundred of them. You had no idea who they all were. Um, and uh, that was kind of the how, the, the per, how I felt, my perception of how uh, things were back then, uh, which is different than how things became as the cleanup progressed. We were much more open, you know. But back in the days when this was still thinking nuke, things. I remember when I took the emergency job, a few months after I got into it, I met with Al Hazel, who was at that time our on-site rep. He officed up there. Um, and Hazel said he'd never want to work for that site. You know, he was an outsider working there, and they got to sort of trust him. But he'd never want to be one of them. And I asked him, well, why? And he said, because they have this mindset that if you step out, you know, everyone, you want to avoid making yourself noticed because you'll get stabbed in the back. There was always this view of, ain't my responsibility, and they'd point it to everyone else. No one was willing to st swing out and take a chance because you could get your head chopped off. I will tell you that by the end of this project, that mentality had completely disappeared. And in, in fact, you know, they really encouraged people to be innovative and come up with new ideas in the cleanup. But back at, in, the, either, in the days when I first got involved, which was right at the, when production had just ended, and they were basically on um, sitting there cold, you know, there, that wasn't the culture. What, what changed? Why did that culture open up? I think a lot of it has to be to the credit of Kaiser Hill, the contractor who came in in 1995. I mean, we obviously had differences of opinion with Kaiser Hill, but they, they, ha they really were successful changing the culture. They were successful pushing um, what, you know, I mean, it wasn't, by, it wasn't easy, but getting the workforce up there who was, you know, been there a long time, who had been making nukes, the steel workers, to basically work themselves out of a job. And, and go from building nukes to tearing down the very buildings that they had worked in all those years. And I mean, I remember a few years ago, three, two, three years ago, they, there was some, I saw some stats on the workforce. The average age was like late 40s. I mean, they'd been there a long time. And uh, they got the workforce motivated to, to do things, and they also motivated to come up with innovative ideas of how to do things better. I was, in the last couple of years, and I'm really jumping some time, but I was really blown away at how you would see workers who basically were working themselves out of the job, but taking great pride in what they'd accomplished. That they felt that what they'd done was really remarkable, and it was. I mean, I've said this innumerable times. Um, I'm not ready to retire yet for a while, and I'm in a job that's a, this new job's a very difficult, important job. But I don't think I'll ever have an experience like I did working on the Rocky Flat stuff. Um, not that that was easy, and it wasn't, and there were lots of times I fantasized about having it end, and finally has. But, you know, I never, you know, as a regulator, rarely do you get involved in something where you see things happen so dramatically so quickly. It got to the point where I remember last December when I, we signed off giving them permission to start tearing down Building 707, one of the plutonium buildings that every nuclear weapon in the U.S. arsenal today went through Building 707. And they, I actually was heading to the airport, so I had to, to a meeting in Washington, D.C., so I had someone on my staff sign the letter for me, you know, because it wasn't quite done when I had to head to the airport. And that letter was faxed up to Rocky Flats, and there were people standing around waiting for the building to come down, waiting for that fax machine to light up. And the minute they got the letter, they went ahead. I mean, to see, you know, as a little regulator, to see your signature, something happened, authorizing to proceed, where you suddenly mobilize literally millions of dollars of work 
and hundreds of people, that was, that was incredible. You know, you felt like you were really making a difference, that you were part of making history. Um, because, um, I mean, 10 years ago when I was dealing with emergency preparedness, I never could have conceived that this site would be gone. Um, again, I'm jumping ahead, but my last visit at Rocky Flats would have been um, probably the second week of July. I went up to the site ahead of me. I, I was actually dressed for the final job interviews for the, the job that ultimately I was hired for, this job. And so I was wearing a suit and I had a DOE Rocky Flats meeting in the morning with DOE Kaiser Hill and EPA in Mountain View. And they've just issued new site access badges. The old badges have been turned in and they've created these new badges because now it's basically a demolition site. So I went up to Building 60, which is where the visitor center was, which is now closed. Um, and I got my new badge here a little over a month ago and I decided, well, I've got a little time before my job interview, I'll drive into the site. And I drove down what's left of Central Avenue and looked south to where all these buildings used to be, including Building 460, where when I first took the job as the project coordinator and cleanup, I used to have, a, that was where DOE's offices used to be. And so I spent a lot of time in 460. Well, 460 was gone as well as everything else around it. And other than bare dirt, you would have had no idea if you would, you know, if you were, that there had been all those buildings there. I mean, it was really pretty unbelievable. So I've jumped way ahead to what I was doing in the early, early to mid 90s uh, and into up to through 1997, but never would I have conceived that this project would get done in the time it did. Well, let's jump way back now, back to the early 90s. When you first came on the site, I wonder if you could describe what it was like and your sure. impression of the buildings. The, well, let me describe the first time I was there. I really didn't know what it looked like. And, you know, I know you know this, but the, all the buildings were concentrated in a very small area, 400 acres. And 800 facilities and 400 acres remained, and those facilities ranged from a shack or a tank to um, building 371 was over 300,000 square feet. I mean, monster buildings. And it just looked like, at that time, the workforce, there were thousands of people and probably not very, being very productive, most of them. I mean, they were just wheel spinning, waiting to see what was gonna happen. So you went in, there were people everywhere. There, you'd go down Central Avenue, and it was like a city. I mean, it looked like rush hour. There, was, um, uh, there were buildings and pipes um, right up to the, the, the Central Avenue. Pipes all over. I had no idea what they were. They were steam pipes. At the time, I had no clue. It just looked like a, of, um, it just, it, you know, what I remember was just lots of activity. Probably, as I said, people walking around, um, just very concentrated industrial facility. I, I didn't know what most of the stuff was. I've since, of course, learned. I mean, um, it, had, it had really grown into a concentrated city. I mean, I have that picture on the wall behind me showing what that, the place looked like. I was, um, you know, it, and uh, that's what it was like. Not like that now, but that's what it was like then. And um, as I got to know, I mean, each of these buildings was, uh, especially the early ones, were really pretty bizarre. I mean, Building 881, the second largest building on the site, 250,000 square feet. One of the original buildings, the first pr three process buildings uh, were known as, uh, well, there was 71, 81, 91. They eventually became 771, 881, 991. And those big processing buildings were built into the hillside to withstand a nuclear strike. And uh, after the Soviets built hydrogen bomb, then it didn't matter, and then they built them above ground. But Building 881, which basically was a no became a non-plutonium building, it was not in the protected area. It was on the it was a secured area at one time, but it's not where the plutonium was. It was on the southeast side of the industrial area, built into the hillside of Woman Creek. On the north side of the building, it was knee high. And um, you walked up to it and your knee would be right at the roof. Um, it was 87 feet deep though. And so you'd go into the building and then you'd go a stairwell going down the various floors. 
Build, building 991, which um, was in the protected area, became one of their shipping centers for shipping spe special nuclear materials, classified shipments of nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons parts. Um, it had these tunnels that went back into the hillside. That went One of them went back 670 square feet into a vault that had um, walls that were 14 feet thick or something, really wild. And I, I went down that. This would have been in September 2003. I was only in that building once. My, some of my people were in it all the time. But I decided I needed to see that building because they were about to seal those tunnels. And uh, it, you know, they were, they'd been completely cleaned out, completely decontaminated. And we walked down that tunnel 670 feet back. It was really pretty spooky. It was kind of lit up with artificial lighting. And a couple weeks later, they sealed that tunnel. And it's, it'll be up there for long after we're gone. It's kind of like an underground pyramid that will be there forever. What, were the, what was the initial intent of the vault in there? Storage of nuclear material, again, designed to store to withstand a, and a hit, you know. So do those buildings, they didn't, uh, they just cleaned them out and covered them up? They didn't in the, in the case them? of those deep tunnels, they did. Most of the buildings, um, you know, it, it varied. Um, in in the, anything that's three feet below grade, they had to pull up per their contract. They had to yank all that stuff out. For deeper structures, they usually would fill them in. Sometimes we make them yank it up, we being the, the state. But I'm kind of jumping into, let me just tell you what I, I in January 98, I became the Rocky Flats Project Coordinator. That was my title. And I held that until 2000, middle, a, month and a, a little over a month ago. Actually, I guess almost exactly a month ago. Um, under the cleanup agreement, there were, the cleanup agreement was signed by the Department of Energy, EPA, and the State Health Department. Kaiser Hill was not a signatory, but they were the contractor implementing the cleanup agreement, so they played an important role throughout this process. They still do. Under the cleanup agreement, the EPA was designated as the lead regulator in the buffer zone. That's the area surrounding all the buildings that makes up the 10 or so square miles of Rocky Flats. The industrial area, the center where all the buildings are, the state health department was the lead regulator. So we ultimately regulated everything that went on in the center of that site, um, including other than the plutonium. Plutonium, we did not regulate the weapons grade plutonium. The Department of Energy did. I mean, under the Atomic Energy Act, that was their domain. We couldn't, we couldn't regulate it. Now we could gum them to tell them. I use that term gum into death. We could pressure them. Under the cleanup agreement, under Rocky Flats cleanup agreement, we could issue them targets. You know, well, you should get this plutonium, this stuff out by such and such a date. We could have a target. And if they failed to meet that target, that would give them some embarrassment. But we couldn't enforce them to do it. We, it wasn't in our control. But once the plutonium was gone, we basically regulated everything. Um, one guy from Kaiser Hill described my job was the benevolent dictator. My job, I mean, we had, a, as the state of Colorado, we were very interested in getting the site cleaned up. You know, a lot of activists who said clean up to background times no issue, we had to deal with the political reality that Congress was spending two millions of dollars a day up there cleaning it up, and Congress can be fickle. So we were interested in getting this site done but we were interested in getting it done in a way that we agreed with, as well as we were um, interested in controlling what got done. Um, the, as I said, one of the big battles um, of, uh, that we had was over what, how the state health department would control what they did. They were worried about us obstructing the process. We were worried about them going carte blanche and not having control over it. Um, the gov a guy named John Swartout, who was in Governor Owens' office, who really knew the DOE stuff. Um, he's no longer in the governor's office. He runs Go Colorado, the Co Colorado lottery money thing. But Swartout and I worked closely together. And his direction to me, if you want to call it direction, was be flexible, think outside the box, solve problems, but retain your authority. It's a big deal as a regulator. 
you, you don't want to give up your control. And there were lots of times where the site would come to us and say, have we got a great deal for us? You know, and how about if you give, give up your hazardous waste authority and subsume it under Superfund? And Colorado's delegated hazardous waste authority. And we wouldn't do it. I mean, that was our teeth. Um, so, um, the, you know, when I, when I became the project coordinator in 98, my, my role changed pretty dramatically. I was no long, I was, I was a regulator. I was involved in having to make difficult decisions in a negotiated setting with the Department of Energy, its contractor, and um, EPA, and with great scrutiny from the communities, from um, activists, from the Citizens Advisory Board, where they were second guessing everything we were doing. It was a very difficult challenge and uh, sometimes pretty unpleasant. Um, but that's what, that's what my, my, my role shifted dramatically um, from em emergency preparedness thing in the, in the early mid 90s to basically um, playing the, the key point, uh, spear taker for the state on the co conduct of the cleanup. Um, and are you, looking back now, are you very happy with the conduct of the cleanup? Do you think it's as clean as it could and should be? And I'm, I'm very proud of the cleanup. I'm, I, that doesn't mean it's clean up to background, but it's clean up to a very protective and low level. Mm -hmm. uh, as Tim Rader, my former counterpart from EPA, used to say, um, this cleanup is far more protective than most large Superfund cleanups. It's more protective than the cleanup at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, for example. The cleanup is um, for, uh, uh, it, for plutonium in the surface is uh, one in, in uh, half million excess cancer risk, hypothetical excess cancer risk, not fatal risk, to a refuge worker who's working up there all the time. You know, we assumed he was working in a contaminated area all the time and, and developed a cleanup level that would be protective to that level. Far, it's far even more protective for someone who's a casual visitor. The, um, you know, there was, it, it's a long, complicated story, and it was one of the most difficult things that I did, was involved in, in my role as the project coordinator, was getting um, cleanup agreement or a uh, modify our cleanup agreement to incorporate cleanup levels that most of the community could embrace. Not all of them. We still have a, you know, there's a strong anti-nuclear contingent who are very outspoken. Uh, Leroy Moore, the Peace and Justice Center, saying the cleanup isn't background. You know, one little speck could kill you. But you know, when you work in a regulatory role and you're making decisions. I mean, I'm confident this is a very protective cleanup, and I'm very proud of what got accomplished up there, or is getting accomplished. I'm, I'm pleased that the, um, thanks to uh, the efforts of some of the, our con Colorado congressional delegation, Senator Allard, uh, Congressman Udall, that this is going to become a refuge, because you, although the industrial area I described earlier was this really wild, uh, industrial facility, the buffer zone is, some of it seems very, is very pristine. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a sad statement on our um, society that in areas close to metropolitan areas, it's places that um, had, had there not been no rocky flats there, it would have been development. It would have been more Rock Creek and Westminster and Broomfield. Same is true with the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And instead, we have places that where in both cases, but at Rocky, you have a prairie that would be gone, and it's a it's a beautiful place. You get down in, in the Rock Creek Valley along where the Lindsay Ranch is, the old ranch house and barn, you have no idea that you're near the metropolitan area, let alone that you've got a nuke plant sitting, or had a nuke plant sitting on the hills up there. I, I remember one time, um, this has been about 1999, where Again, I was involved in the cleanup then. My boss, Howard Reutemann, and I went up on a tour, all-day tour of various parts of Rocky Flats. And we went into some of the, the plutonium buildings, or so in these ugly industrial buildings. 
You had to suit, you know, wear the protective clothing and all that. And then we spent the afternoon cruising around the buffer zone. It was a beautiful September afternoon, and we get down and turn the engine off in the car by the pond at Lindsay Ranch, and it's just this idyllic setting. It was just such a dichotomy, you know, from what we had just been in in the morning. So I'm really pleased that that's what's happening, and uh, I'm. Uh, I, and I'm amazed. I, I've said that before. I'm amazed that so many things came together to be successful. We were able to work um, most of the time cooperatively with the Department of Energy and its contractor that, um, in, in, in what they call a consultative process. I mean, uh, having a dialogue and collaborating with them, that doesn't mean that things just always went hunky-dory and we sang together at the end of every meeting, kumbaya. I mean, it was sometimes ugly and strong disagreements, but we were able to solve problems and sort things out on how they proceed. We were able to, you know, my people had complete access to the buildings, complete access to the records. Um, it became a, um, and, and that's a completely different world than what I described a few minutes ago of what the early 90s were like, the Jonestown mentality, where they treated us as outsiders and with suspicion. So were there times when you, you did have difficulty getting access to areas of the plan or information that you needed um, for your job? The, it was an evolutionary process. Um, you know, I can't vouch for how things were. I was not in the role of managing the cleanup in the early to mid-90s when it just got started. By 1998, a few things had been done. I mean, most of the cleanup was still ahead of us. Um, so some of the, but some of those disagreements were getting ironed out then. There was, as I said earlier, there was great suspicion about particularly taking down the buildings. Most of the money was going to be spent in getting rid of the plutonium and taking down the buildings. The environmental cleanup part, although expensive, wasn't nearly as expensive as decontaminating those buildings and taking them down. The, um, uh, the, that was the most complicated part of the, part of the project, the most, largest amount of waste, the most dangerous part of the project. The, the buildings some of the buildings were incredibly contaminated. They had no idea how to do it. Um, so that was one of the most contentious parts, was arguing over our regulatory authority in how this was going to do. We came in saying basically the, everything. We have authority over everything. They go and they were trying to minimize that authority. And so we had these knock-on drag-outs of how to sort this out in a way that could be manageable. You know, they, um, the cleanup agreement set up these protocols called RIFCA, R, they call them RSAPs, RIFCA for Rocky Flats Cleanup Agreement, Standard Operating Protocols. And RSAPs um, would, for something that you're doing over and over and over, um, it was basically a regulatory uh, document that would be approved by the regulators, EPA and the state to allow them to proceed in doing things that they do on a routine basis, like removing, tearing down buildings. They do that all the time. Removing contaminated equipment, um, rubbleizing concrete, um, digging up contaminated soil. It's, just, it's pretty similar from one spot to another. And so those help streamline the regulatory process. So if we had an RSOP in place for, which we did, for component removal, or, or facility disposition. They, they would follow that, they would notify us, well, we plan on using this RSOP for this particular building. And we would authorize them to do it, and then they could follow the, the, the approved process in that RSOP. For the big buildings, the complicated plutonium buildings, the five plutonium buildings, we had specific d d d documents that called DOPS, decommissioning operation plans, that provided the regulatory license if you will, for them to proceed to gut that building and take it down. And then we, but I mean, there were many places where we had, they had to get our mother may I endorsement, you know, for um, approving how to proceed. And, and what happened is, you know, they were, as I said, in the 98, 99, they were very concerned about how we were going to get things done and that we would hamstring it. By the end of the project, they, they, they had recognized that we had successfully, we being us and the site, 
developed a system where basically we were able to timely respond and get our issues addressed in a manner that allowed them to continue um, to proceed with doing work. We did not hamstring the process. We did not slow it down. I mean, there were times they, they needed to get something done before we'd allow something to proceed, but we were, it, was, it became pretty systematic. And, and by the end, I would say that almost everything they did, they would seek our endorsement. You know, um, it could be very informal things. They would, call, they would capture it in what they called a regulatory contact record. I talked with Dave Krucek, who was the guy who worked on our staff. They would identify Krucek as a contact, and Krucek worked in our non -plutonium, the non-plutonium buildings. And they'd say, we're, they'd lay out this, we, we talked with Krucek about this and how we're going to do with this. Krucek agreed to it, and they would capture that in a record. And every, you know, I would have dozens of these cross my electronic email on a daily basis. And then the formal things, I mean, we would approve that the building was suitable. Before it was even, they could take it down, we, it would have to meet our satisfaction that they had decontaminated to the agreed upon level, which usually was completely decontaminated. Um, so it, you know, I, I know I'm kind of wandering around, but we were able to get things um, to a point where we really had control over what was being done there and it, to a point where they were comfortable with the fact that we had a control over it, which was a very different thing than, say, in 98, 99, where they were very suspicious that we were going to hamstring the project. Um, you know, it, 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 um, it, it and, and I compare it with what is happening at other DOE sites around the complex. So they're making progress at those sites, but it's still, it, Many of them, you know, people who work for DOE or its contractor who have now left to go work at Idaho or Hanford, they say it's like going back 10 years. It's like where we were 10 years ago in terms of the relationships, the lack of trust, the lack of being innovative, the, 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 uh, the worry about getting the community. We, we were more and more willing to just lay our cards on the tables with the communities. I mean, the communities never were completely satisfied with that, but, you know, we'd give them, they, the site would give a, a, a document to the communities most, in most cases at the same time they gave the, a regulatory document to us, rather than waiting till we reviewed it and then we'd send it out for this formal project public comment period that was required under the cleanup agreement. You know, it was much more of an open, collaborative process where we were all working together to, to solve something, which was to tear down this site and, and close it. Um, you know, there were disagreements, but, um, and you know, there were arguments over the cleanup levels or arguments over certain little aspects, but everyone had the same goal in mind. The community understood this site was going away. You know, in other communities, that's a big deal. If you're a small town and most of your work community relies on a big DOE site next door, that site going away would be catastrophic. Here we had a robust enough and large enough economy where we could absorb those losses. Um, you know, we had, uh, you know, a congressional delegation that provided, that for the most cases was bipartisan and in our goal is closing this site, you know, and, and put an effort to do that. And uh, we had both a, a regulatory, we, it, it was a long evolutionary process, it didn't happen overnight, but we developed a, enough of a level of trust in, in, in interpersonal relationships where we could work with between the regulators and the community uh, and the and the Department of Energy and its contractor to say, look, we've got to solve this, and that's we were able we've been able to do that. Okay, I'm stop you. All right, I'm gonna go down the hall. <laughs> at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment in Denver, it's the 16th of August, 2005, and um, I'm Hannah Nordhaus. So. Um, Let's see. Um, I have a bunch of questions here. I guess um, one of the things I'm wondering is um, both in terms of emergency preparedness and, and your later work um, determining cleanup levels, um, 
were, did you have a greater fear of radioactive accidents than non-radioactive, or were there a lot of non-radioactive hazards that people didn't seem to perceive as as hazardous as they were? Actually, that's an excellent question, and maybe you've asked that to other people to get their answer. But um, in fact, the site said this all the time, and I agree with them that the biggest danger from Rocky Flats wasn't the ra the ke the chemical and radiological hazards; it was the physical hazards. At least when you take down the site, you know the the clearly when they had all the weapons grade uh, or all the chemicals, uh, the plutonium um, materials or or liquids, the acids and bases in the tanks and pipes. The risk of a criticality accident was a very real risk, and uh, fortunately that didn't happen. But once those tanks and pipes were drained, there were still radiological hazards, there were still chemical hazards, they still got workers who had uh, exposures that, you know, I remember in 779 a worker got, uh, was using a sawzaw, a saw to cut metal and puncture, got a, cut his hand and got an exposure in his hand, um, you know, as, as the demolition progressed, they found innovations that made it so that the workers weren't so close to the material. They're, they didn't use saws as much as they used torches and other ways to cut things up. And then they found ways to uh, decontaminate equipment that was highly contaminated so that it could be shipped as uh, low-level waste rather than transuranic waste so it didn't have to be cut up so small. They found ways to ship big pieces of equipment without cutting them up. They would actually spray paint this black goop. It was, um, what did they call it? Um, Instacoat, they called it. That would actually turn rock hard and then that, that plastic cover would be the sh meet the Department of Transportation requirements for shipping. So they were able to reduce the workers ex um, having to work in very contaminated areas, cutting things up. But nonetheless, the big hazard of taking down big buildings is the industrial hazard. The risk of falls, the risk of having something fall on you, the risks of having a big piece of equipment slam into you, uh, the risks of um, electric electrocution. They had some unbelievable close calls with electrocution. I mean, the site took great pride, Kaiser Hill and Department of Energy took great pride on their safety stats. You know, OSHA has ways of how uh, an industrial facility records its accident rate. And, and if you looked at the accident rates from DOE and Rocky Flats, they were far lower than the national rate for both construction sites and nuclear sites. But as they point out, your accident rates were only as good as the next, until the next time you had an accident. If you had hurt somebody, those accident statistics meant nothing. And they had a couple times where they would, you know, the press would go after them over increased risk of accidents. You know, um, Rocky Flats was working in a fishbowl. They were always in the press. Um, and the, um, but, you know, they did have some close calls with certain things, particularly electrocutions. Um, one of the, a couple examples, they, uh, they thought they'd turn the power off in a room, and they start cutting through the wall. Well, those, these old buildings didn't have up-to-date blueprints. They'd modified them over the years, and the blueprints weren't kept up to date. Well, they hit a live power line, and, and you know, the, they, the, they get this huge spark. Amazingly, the guy wasn't electrocuted. Another close call I recall is um, where they had um, a crane working to clean up an area under an old building pad. And they still had live power lines up above. And this crane did something improper, hit that power line. And there was a worker standing right nearby. And it was amazing that did, electricity didn't ground him and electrocute him. Um, so as they started making, they learned from these, these close calls. Thankfully, no one was hurt. And they would you know, they would start doing things like when they were starting to tear down an area, they would turn the power off as soon as they possibly could to the whole area. So there was no way there would be electricity around. Um, other cases uh, was, as I said, close calls, forklift truck incidents. Um, they had one case here a few months ago where they were tearing down a building and they were using a, um, 
some a piece of equipment like a bobcat or something, and this was pulling on something. Well, this this or pulling in a certain direction, this thing flipped back and slammed into the cab and crushed the front of the cab. And had they not had this big plexiglass thing, the guy would have been killed. You know, um, they had some they had problems uh, with bringing in subcontractors where the subcontractors just weren't used to meeting the sta safety requirements of the site. They were more used to what you see out there in the real world, I guess you'd say. And the subcontractor just couldn't, you know, they'd come in with a, a bid that was low, and then they didn't, um, they'd try to poor boy the operation and they'd and create some risks. I, I mean, some of these were almost humorous. I remember my staff telling me where they had um, taken the steps off a trailer you know, an office trailer. So these guys walk out, walk out the door, the door wasn't marked, and there was no steps. So they walk out and they fall three feet to the ground. Um, dumb things, or, or building ladders. In one case, and they were working in building 865, which was a building contaminated with uranium and beryllium, and a company there was not, you know, they finally basically removed them. But they had guys, they had the, um, working on ladders next to this massive equipment and using these wrenches for these giant nuts that had been si frozen solid for a half century. And they're up on a ladder putting all their weight and pressure on that nut, you know, I mean, could have fallen off. Um, so then they would say no ladders and they would use man lifts. Um, they learned from their mistakes. They were very good at going through and reviewing any sort of cause, any sort of, if they saw it, indicators. An indicator was some sort of pattern or a trend that would suggest that they're, they're not paying close enough attention to detail. But as I said, they were lucky because all you, you know, you could have all the proper protocols and procedures in the world, but if a guy's not paying attention, having a bad day, he could, he could screw up. They could never completely get human error out of the process. Um, but fortunately, they've been very lucky. And last week, um, the last uh, building went down at Rocky, building 371. They still have office trailers. They still got to fill in the hole. Building 371, that was a building that parts were 60 feet deep. Um, that was the most robust building on the site. But the structure above ground is gone. Um, I got an email from some one of my old contacts up there Thursday afternoons, and, you know, just uh, as I was sitting here at that desk, uh, I said, well, well, I'm standing here watching the last of it go away. So, um, In terms of uh, radioactive versus non-radioactive um, safety threats to the community, w was there any, you know, large threat to the community that wasn't, that didn't have anything to do with radioactivity? Chemicals. There, there, at, uh, there used to be huge tanks, um, nitric acid tanks massive tanks. Those were taken down pretty early in the project, but they used to be full of nitric acid. And um, that was probably the biggest chemical risk at the site. Nitric acid, it was pretty concentrated, and if it releases, it can produce these orange fumes of very corrosive acid. Mm -hmm. And I think some of those were viewed as off-site consequences. They used to have tanks of hydrofluoric acid. I mean, most of Rocky Flats, what they did is they would take plutonium that came from mostly Hanford, produced up at Hanford in the, their reactors, and they would machine it into bomb parts. And they would dissolve it using various methods. Uh, they did a lot of dissolving of plutonium and strong acids and bases, strong corrosives. And so they would have huge tanks of hydrochloric acid or, um, <coughs> excuse me, they had tanks of hydrofluoric acid at one time, a hydrofluoric acid tank bar, which is incredibly dangerous acid, just unbelievably dangerous, corrosive. Um, they had carbon tetrachloride tanks, big tanks. Um, but in terms of off-site hazards, I think nitric acid, the tanks were real big. And um, they did some things to uh, reduce the risk. They, for one, at one time, they had the tanks, they had two tanks and um, out, these are outdoor tanks sitting on their side, and underneath it they had a big concrete berm. So um, the problem was it was one berm for both tanks. And if you say a tank failed, that berm would fill up and you'd have all this surface area of acid 
that would, you know, more surface area and with the heat that would cause more acid to fume. So what they did is they split that berm in half. So if you did have a tank failure, it, only, it would be less surface area, you know, so there was less interface between the acid and the atmosphere to cause the fuming to generate. So they, they found ways to try to mitigate some of that risk. But, you know, there were, at, during the production days, there were big chemicals stored up there. And the concern would be that the fume, if there was a leak, it would fumes that would leak out into the... No, it could go off-site off and cause a hazard, like along Highway 93 or something. I don't remember now what the, you know, they calculated the risk. I should mention during the emergency days, they built a, a plume tracking system called track. It was called, at one time, it was called tra track Terrain Responsive Atmospheric Code. And then it changed its name to KPARS, and I don't remember what KPARS stood for. But it was a state-of-the-art plume modeling system that they used um, that would calculate it, every day you'd, you'd go to the State Emergency Operations Center and you would see these computer screens and it would simulate what would happen if they had a release of what at that time was called a maximum credible accident which was a hundred grams of plutonium lifted airborne in a fire and they viewed that was at that time they viewed that as the greatest accident with off-site consequences and they would they, that you would look on a screen that if that moment while you're looking at the screen they had a release, it would take the weather conditions that were occurring at that time and as well as it would take into account the terrain because you know heavier than air material will go down in low spots or the terrain will affect the wind patterns and it would project what the consequences would be. We never had to use that in an emergency at Rocky Flats, we used it in exercises. But well, we did use it in other emergencies in the Denver metro area. Um, the, in 1991, I, one of my first big emergencies I dealt with in this department was at the Stapleton a Airport. They had a huge tank farm of jet fuel catch on fire. It, I don't know if you lived here then, but they had big plumes of smoke uh, on the Sunday after um, Thanksgiving blowing you know, up in the air, it dominated the skyline. It was big news. They couldn't get, for two days, they couldn't get the fire out. They finally got Boots and Coots, which was a company that was used in the Kuwait when Saddam put all the oil wells on fire. They got Boots and Coots from Texas up and they put the fire out. But we were dealing with that as a health department, dealing with that emergency and what the consequences were to citizenry and all that. And we used Rocky Flats to do plume modeling to model where the wit winds would go or carrying the, this black sooty smoke. And we were having, the concern was we were going to get a cold front a couple days coming in and uh, you know what would happen with the plume? Well it wasn't going to start going north towards Commerce City, it would turn around and start going south we thought. So we were using that and as the weather front moved in we could see we were getting the plume modeling showing us this is where the plume's going and our man in the field, a guy named Stan May, would say, well, I'm looking here on the radio and said, I'm seeing the plume and he'd tell me exactly what was doing there. We used that also in a case where we had an, in a criminal case involving a company that had a release of chlorine during the fires in the mid-90s um, down along Waterton Canyon. We helped use that plume modeling to suggest where the fire was going. It was, we used it elsewhere, but never at Rocky. So, um, so in terms of uh, cleanup levels, you said that, that the, the Rocky Flats cleanup level is, is, is um, higher or lower, would I, is better than Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Um, and is that, I mean, is there a public fear of radiation that, that dictates Drove that? that? Well, there's definitely a public fear of radiation. Rocky Flats has all the great, you know, buzzwords that create concern. Plutonium, nuclear weapons, radioactive, hazardous waste. Um, but uh, what, it's a long, complicated story. It took about eight years. But after the cleanup agreement was signed in 1996, the agencies came up with a first cleanup level. They called it interim soil action level. And an action level is basically a level at which you take an action, which is you do cleanup. And um, the level was uh, based on a, an anticip the anticipated land use. It's, it's a long, complicated story, but they looked at the cleanup and they ran through these 
various calculations uh, using these um, accepted models to calculate what the risk was. And uh, they, they came up with a, a regulatorily acceptable cleanup level of 651 picocuries per gram of plutonium. And that assumed a little, certain amount of americium, which is a daughter product, with a plutonium. Usually you get one, you get the other. It, it's a breakdown of, of one of the isotopes of plutonium produces americium, which is the stuff they use in um, smoke detectors. And uh, the community was outraged. They, you know, virtually all the community felt that number was way too high. And uh, they got a lot of DOE, got a lot of pressure, and Al Alm, who was the Assistant Secretary for Environmental Management for DOE at the time, said, okay, well, we'll fund uh, another assessment of those numbers. And so they ended up hiring, um, uh, when, when I first came on board in January of 98 as the project coordinator, they, the community, uh, led by Hank Stovall, who was a city councilor with Broomfield at the time, um, formed a committee of citizens and uh, city officials to hire a contractor funded by DOE to calculate new cleanup levels. And they hired a company uh, named RAC, uh, Risk Assessment Corporation, and they ended up you know, basically redoing the calculations. And they assumed a, instead of what we have to do under Superfund, which is you base your cleanup on the anticipated land use, which at Rocky is going to be some type of open space. Um, the community, or they said, well, we're going to have this land use of we're going to assume a rancher lives up there. And they live there all the time. They never, ever leave. They get all their food from the site. They get all their water from the site. They grow their meat on the site. They never, ever leave. And then they said, well, we'll assume that there's a big fire that denudes the land of all vegetation, but we'll still have the person stay there. We won't have them leave. And uh, we'll still have them get all their foods and fruits and vegetables, but the land will be denuded of all vegetation for a year. And uh, then and and they're going to be breathing all this dust that's contaminated. So they came up with a cleanup level for that scenario of 35 picocuries per gram. Actually, it was somewhere they said somewhere between 10 and 80, and we'll pick 35. Community loved it. They embraced the number. They everyone, including the peace center, embraced the number. And we were stuck with this number where everyone said, "Here's our answer. This is what we want to clean up to." Well. We still have to follow the regulatory process. We still have to, you know, our regs of how you do things. And, um, I mean, this gets incredibly complicated. We also knew that um, the amount of money Congress was earmarking for this cleanup would most likely meet the regulatory requirements for cleanup. Kaiser Hill's contract with the Department of Energy said they had to meet it. So the trick was, how are you going to satisfy the community with the amount of money where Congress is going to provide, which we think is going to meet regulatory requirements for cleanup. So we went through this long process with the public. You know, we set up weekly, a lot of intense public meetings. Um, we invited the public to sit in on our technical groups that were meeting on a weekly basis to calculate new numbers. And uh, we, at that time, knew that this was going to likely become a national wildlife refuge. So we said, well, our end the person who's most likely going to be up there all the time is a refuge worker. So we said that's what our cleanup's going to have to be based on is protecting that worker who's exposed the most. But we also looked at calculated cleanup risks if we built houses up there and all this stuff. And um, we, set, we started looking at, again this gets complicated, but looking at the regulatory regime for calculating these cleanup levels. Um, and without getting into details, that regime had changed from when the first numbers were calculated in the 90s. And, and under Superfund, you have to do two things. You have to meet what's called an ARAR, what's relevant and appropriate regulations that are relevant to a cl this cl cleanup, even though this is a Superfund cleanup. And that gets, con I'm, I'm not going to get into that a lot. But you also have to make certain the cleanup falls within a risk range of 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 1 million excess cancer risk to an anticipated land user. And that's a 1 in 10,000 to 1 in a million, that's a broad risk range. 
So we said, well, let's calculate those numbers. And we went through this process of calculating the numbers, you know, that are what's, you know, your minimum cleanup has to be about one in a 10,000. And a, you know, a very protective cleanup on the other end is one in a million. You know, and this is excess cancer risk above your normal risk of developing cancer in your lifetime. And for an American, your risk of getting, developing cancer is somewhere between one and two and one and three if you live a full life. I mean, it's fairly high risk. Just the longer we live, the greater our chances of getting cancer. So this would be cancer, a risk of cancer on top of it because of exposure to plutonium or other, there were other contaminants we looked at. All, we looked at all of them. They determine that risk by saying if you get a plutonium particle, if you breathe it in, then, I mean, how do they determine that what additional risk that plutonium would Well, so that's also a long, complicated process. They go through, um, there are these um, groups of, uh, of um, committees over the year, decades who've looked at plutonium and they've, they've looked at studies of plutonium. Generally, what they assume for plutonium or, or radionuclide is they have cases, historical cases, of people getting sick from this stuff. But it's usually very high exposures, like Nagasaki, Hiroshima, or some huge industrial accident. And they assume that extreme risk, and they just assume that there's no such thing, they call it the um, uh, linear no threshold value, that basically a no matter any, any exposure to a radiological contaminant is, is not a good thing. And any exposure involves some risk. But the lower the exposure, the lower the risk. So they take these cases where they have documented exposures, where they know they've got consequences from an exposure, and they go to zero and they draw a straight line. So from here, a very low level exposure, very low, very low, very low, and then they increase it up, and the, the greater the exposure, the greater the risk. Um, so, but if you look at data, you know, when you get extremely low levels of exposure, it's pretty hard to document a difference between your normal population because we get exposed to radioactivity all the time. So you, it's pretty hard to s demonstrate a risk at very low levels. But we assume there's one. So you calculate what they call a cancer slope factor, where the question is, that straight line, what's the angle on that line? The steeper the angle, the greater the risk. The lower the angle, the lower the risk. So you, they actually create these cancer slope factors, and you use these in calculating risk. And uh, so we looked at plutonium. We looked at a scenario of a worker or a resident, and they're out there, and the residents getting eating food and their kids eating in the dirt, you know, and we calculate these things. And for the refuge worker, our initial numbers came that one in a million excess cancer risk is five picocuries per gram. One in 10,000 is 500. It, those numbers actually moved around some. And we started saying, well, what if we said we're going to make this clean up one in 100,000 um, excess cancer risk? So one in 100,000, that's 50. Well, then the community wanted these numbers peer reviewed. They wanted outsiders to look at our calculations. So DOE agreed to fund that, and they had to bring in some academics to look at it. Well, the academics kind of backfired, I guess you'd say, for the community. The academics said, look, they, they, they did not, they were over conservative. They weren't objective enough. And this would not pass in a peer reviewed journal. And they, they pointed some things out, and we agreed to some, but then we also said, look, we're not here to calculate numbers to, for other academics. We're here because you know, we're trying to deal with the community. So we were OK with some of the over-conservatism. But what it meant was that ultimately, I think the numbers for one in a million turned out to be about nine, and one in um, uh, uh, 10,000 turned out to be 900. So actually, one in 100,000 is 90. But by then, we'd already said, we ta started talking 50. Kaiser Hill, the contractor, said, look, we could do the cleanup for un out of 50 picocuries. And so that's how the, the plutonium number came. And every contaminant had numbers. Um, then what we said is, well, we can do the surface at 50, but we, with the amount of money, we are not going to be able to do the deep buildings at that level. 
I mean, that's a very low level. A picocuri is a trillionth of a curie of plutonium, very low number. Um, so um, we said, uh, and, and with the site had hired these, these experts from all over the country who were experts on plutonium and its behavior in the environment. And plutonium is an incredibly insoluble metal, um, far more insoluble than lead or iron or uranium even. And so it, it moves in the environment by particle form, mo mostly by wind blown or by surface water erosion. So he said, look, if it's in the subsurface, it's not going to move very well. So we should focus our priority on the shallow contamination. So we said the top three feet. Um, in the s deeper subsurface, we said, well, we've got thousands of groundwater wells up there. We don't even see plutonium in the groundwater because it's ins very insoluble. So there was a lot of controversy over that. There was big questions. Well, what about these process wastelines that connect the buildings? You know, some of those leaked. Maybe there's lots of plutonium under there. And that was one of the heartburns that over the cleanup that we ultimately agreed to because at that time we had some information about what was in the subsurface, but not a lot. We weren't going to know more until the buildings were gone. Well, we had, based on the science, we thought there wasn't much there. Well, we even overestimated how much was there. There wasn't much plutonium in and under the buildings at all. We very rarely found it. Um, the buildings did a pretty good job keeping the stuff. The biggest environmental insults were where they put plutonium, like at the 903 pad, where they put drums out there that corroded, and plutonium got out into the environment that way. So that's why I say the cleanup's a lot better. I mean, our, we still get people saying, well, you, you know, you, um, you don't know what's all there in the deep subsurface. Well, I would argue because our people were up there all the time watching, we have a pretty good handle there's not much there. And usually, even when we were there, if we found something, we'd just say, well, you're, since you're there, dig it up anyway, even if you don't have to. And 99.9% .9 they just do it anyway. Just because they're there, best management practices, dig it up. Chip it somewhere else. And that's another thing. Rocky Flats is the only place where all our, the waste that we generated, the plutonium contaminated waste we generated, all the radioactive waste, went somewhere else. It all went out of state. You know, most other DOE sites, they build a disposal cell. They didn't at Rocky. Um, so I gather that you feel are comfortable that it is safe now. Mm -hmm. um, when it was in production or at, right after it closed, was it as dangerous as portrayed in the media and as I'd the say feared? It, it was definitely a dangerous place, particularly to the workers. I, I mean, I think the chances of some, you know, the whole metropolitan area being wrecked by Rocky Flats was pretty incredible. But it was a very dangerous place to the workers um, back in the 90s. I should, since we're talking about the cleanup, there are a couple things I should talk about here in the short time we have left about some of the reasons why Rocky Flats has gotten done. You know, um, you've probably heard this said that in the 1995, uh, DOE estimated it would take about 40 years, 40 to 60 years, like in, I think it was 60 years, and about $37 billion to clean up this site. And it's taken 10 years. They've got ahead of schedule, and it's going to cost about $7 billion. And why is that? You know, you'll hear activists say, well, that's because they're doing a shoddy cleanup. Well, that's, I will vehemently disagree with that. Um, what happened is a variety of things. I mean, we had the right people at the right time working on this who could solve problems. Certainly that was a factor. The cleanup agreement that we have in place was uh, flexible enough. This was the third cleanup agreement that we had between DOE, EPA, and the state. The first two failed. And the, there was one in the 80s, then there was one in 1991 called the Interagency Agreement, and then this RIFCA, 1996. It was kind of like our own version of the concept uh, constitution. It wasn't perfect, but it was flexible enough. Um, we, as we get developed confidence in the, in the contract uh, that the work was getting done, the regulators were more flexible about imposing regulatory milestones on the site. Instead of saying, well, you need to get this much work done in this building by such and such a date, which me would mean that the contractor would focus all their resources there, which may not be very efficient. 
as we started seeing that they were producing results, we would say, well, all right, you need to get a certain amount of building decommissioning work done, but you get to pick and choose where you work, or a certain amount of waste shipped, or a certain number of environmental areas cleaned up. So we would give them more flexibility. Um, Rocky Flats, the, the Superfund cleanup is done in a very different way than it normally is done. The normally what is done is you, do, you, you go and gather all your data, you do a risk assessment, you um, explore various options of what you do, you select a proposed plan, you go off for public comment on that, then it leads to a record of decision, formal record of decision, you do work. That's how they started doing Rocky Flats in the early 90s. They divided the site up into 16 operable units and they would, were planning, they gathered all this data, they planned to lead a record of decision. The problem at Rocky is that a lot of the data you needed was under those buildings. And it didn't make a whole lot of sense when all the plutonium was there and you could barely get a piece of equipment in the secured area because of the high security. Or a sa environmental sample, which I remember we took a water sample. It took us two days to get a bottle of water out of the protected area. You had to go through all this red tape. So Congress would have lost money big time, long time ago, if we'd tried to do it that way. So the thinking was, well, let's gather information as we're doing work. You know, so we, we will be start to do work and then we'll, we'll, you know, we'll accumulate data. And so they, there was an interest at EPA in the, uh, in, at that time to try to find ways to do Superfund better because everyone was throwing rocks at Superfund saying all they're doing is they're studying stuff, they're not doing physical work. So we did the work as accelerated actions. And uh, that's why I say soil action levels. And the, and the record of decision isn't even signed yet. Won't be probably for at least another year. Um, so what they've done is they've done, they, they have this action level and, in, and, and it leads to a conservatism. Normally the way you do a cleanup under Superfund is you divide the area up into various units. You calculate risk on a unit average risk over a unit of certain size based on the land use and if you exceed that limit then you've got to do work in that unit. Soil action levels, what we did is basically if you have a point that exceeds that 50 it requires you to do work, you don't average it. So they're doing all this work as accelerated actions. Once the physical work is done, which will be this fall, then they turn around and they do a full-blown risk assessment of the whole site just saying, all right, what's left the residual risk to make certain everything meets regulatory requirements and then they'll do the record of the decision at the end. So by doing that, we were able to show, demonstrate to Congress that, hey, this site's making progress. I don't mind putting money here because we're getting results. So that was a factor. Clearly, the DOE making the contractor, incentivizing the contractor where they get a lot of money if they succeed has been very important. The old way of DOE doing business is what they call a maintenance and operation contract, M&O. And what that would mean is the contractor would get paid whether they did any, nothing or did something or not. And you'd have a low-level DOE bureaucrat say, well, do this. Might not have any value, but they do that. They get their fee. They get a guarantee a profit. And they spent more money in the early 90s per year than they did now, and they got nothing done. But by incentivizing the contract, and in the last six years, they just basically gave Kaiser Hill, here's your scope of work. You've got to get these buildings gone. You've got to remove all this infrastructure. You've got to get these cleanups done, have this laid out scope of work. How you do it is basically, you've got to do it safely. You've got to do it regulatory requirement, otherwise you'll be fine. But how you do it is your ball game. And if you get it done early, by, and, and under budget, by innovation, if you fill that scope of work, you'll get even save some 30 cents on the dollar. For if you get things done early, you'll get 30 cents on the dollar of the money you save. And, but here's the downside. If it costs you more money, or if you're over budget, you'll end up owing, paying, have to pay in 30 cents on the dollar. So it was a high risk, high reward contract. A lot of, they've had a hard time getting other sites to head that way, but it was a real successful. It really forced Kaiser Hill when they had a bunch of drums they called orphan waste. They didn't know where their home was. Well, it really incentivized them to be innovative. It incentivized, in, when they signed the contract in 
the new contract in 2000, they didn't even know, think they could make, get this project done for that amount of money, but it helped them figure out ways to do things smarter, safer, cheaper in the buildings. And um, so those are a couple big factors as to why this site's getting done. Have, um, were there infractions that they were fined for as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, both DOE fined them for safety violations. Um, the state fined them. We fined them for a missed regulatory milestone under the cleanup agreement. And the health departments fined them over violations over the hazardous waste laws over the last, uh, since the mid-80s, we find them over $3 million over, over a variety of violations, not getting certain things done in a certain time frame, having a spill that we felt was not properly managed, that type of stuff. So yeah, we, we'd find them. I mean, it, I think it was important, given that we were working so closely with the site and the collaborative nature, that it's important to show that we did have the regulatory teeth to whack them and that we would whack them. They didn't like it, and they never liked it. I mean, um, they, they often viewed that a, a, a um, fine was an, a real black eye for them. I remember when we fined them for a missed, they were supposed to get building 551, I think it was, set up for storage of true waste drums by a certain date. This was a regulatory milestone under the cleanup agreement, and they weren't going to make it. And I uh, remember Barbara Mazurowski, the general manager for DOE at the time, who I thought highly of, but she went to uh, my executive director basically saying, um, you know, I've never had a, f a, re a regulatory fine, an environmental fine. I don't want to have one. We said, well, <laughs> should have done your job. I mean, we, we find them anyway. So um, we, uh, um, you know, we, we find them over the years. Um, you had said very early on in the interview you discussed the, con I think it was the contentious relationship between the state and, I wrote down EPA, but I'm thinking I DOE. DOE, yeah. yeah. Um, what's the history of that? Well, I mean, it's just, it's similar to the history of uh, the Department of Energy and the surrounding community. I mean, you know, it's true in every form of government, including state government, if you lose credibility, it's pretty hard to gain it back. Mm -hmm. Rocky Flats for years, I mean, Len Acklin in his book describes this, was a place that everything was done in secret. The 1957 fire was a secret, you know, big fire in 771. When they had the 69 fire, that got some media attention. 57 fire did, uh, got a little blurb, but, you know, very little was set. You know, it was very suspicious, and, and, when, and when the extent of the problem was identified, the department had a terrible reputation, and then, and, and the Department of Energy's way they dealt with state government was, you can't tell us what to do. You know, I mean, that's usually the, often the federal government's take on something. Well, we agree that's important, but we don't want a state agency to tell us it's important. We're the federal government. It's not just DOE, it's a federal, federal mindset. A lot of times laws will be passed and they'll exempt the federal government from the law. And so there was that type of thing. And, and the, the, you know, we were viewed as the enemy because we were out there trying to force them to do certain things. They didn't want to do it. And we view them as the enemy because they didn't want to do it. You know, it was that type of thing. Um, so there was this decades of suspicion and distrust. I've heard people from DOE say that working at Rocky Flats used to be viewed as the turkey farm. You know, it was a place that the relationships were terrible, both with the community and the state. You know, it was a place things failed, didn't happen. You know, that turned around. And, and it turned around really in about 10 years. So was it was brought to the head, ahead by the FBI raid? Was that sort of a turning point then in terms of? No, I think that actually made things even worse. Um, it, it just really resented, resent, generated resentment. Some of the allegations that were led to the raid didn't turn out to be accurate. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it really didn't start turning around until I'd say the mid-90s when mm -hmm. they started being able to demonstrate progress uh, and get results and uh, then that they started realizing that we weren't completely a, a, this totally obstructionist bureaucracy that they couldn't do work with. It, you know, I'd say it really evolved in the last 10 years. Um, 
Uh, oh, so uh, I'm, do you think that it was um, a good de decision to stop production of the plant? I mean, could a plant like that exist in, in a metropolitan area like this anymore? Um, not that plant. <laughs> I mean, I, well, you're asking me my view full out. I'm pretty queasy about nuclear weapons production. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it, I, I'm, I, and what the world events today of nuclear non-proliferation scare me even more. I recognize that I don't think it's just a fluke that we did not have a major huge war in the last 60 years since World War II. Clearly, nukes did serve as some sort of deterrent, mm -hmm. but it's a scary deterrent. and. Um, I, it is, I mean, I don't know that much about nuclear weapons technology, but the fact of the matter is that when you have a pluton bomb that has plutonium in it, the plut some parts of the plutonium decay faster than others, some isotopes. Plutonium-241 decays to americium, which makes it the nuclear weapon more dangerous, like if it's in a submarine because it has, uh, um, it has, uh, um, more of a gamma ray emitting nature. It also reduces the yield and the effectiveness of the weapon. So as long as you have nuclear weapons, you probably need to have some sort of process like Rocky Flats mm -hmm. to keep the weapons clean, if you will. One of Rocky Flats' mission was to take the old method weapons and extract the americium, which they sent to Oak Ridge, and then that was made into smoke detectors. Mm -hmm. But you know, I mean, my own, v I mean, I'm not a big fan of nuclear weapons. Yeah. I mean, ideally, it, um, you know, I know that a lot of the workforce has taken great pride in what they did both when during the Cold War and certainly have taken great pride in what they've done during the cleanup. You know, it's, I, I think the legacy of a Rocky Flats as well as the other sites, I mean, some of the other DOE sites are far more contaminated, Oak Ridge and Hanford, for example, Savannah River, are far more contaminated than Rocky was. And Rockies had some contamination, but fortunately we didn't have a lot of water up there, not a lot of groundwater, and, and most of the contamination stayed in the buildings. The danger at Rocky was all that pl weapons-grade plutonium. But still, um, it is, I remember in 92 I toured Hanford um, in southeast Washington and there was a guy an environmental guy uh, from EG&G, the contractor there, who said something. I mean, I was shocked at the extent of the impact of the Hanford. It, it is, if you've ever heard much, I mean, the environmental insult is cat catastrophic. And he said, Hanford's a classic example of what happens when government operates without checks and balances. And that's Rocky Flats, too, to a lesser extent. But for years, the focus was building on nukes. DOE's predecessor, the Atomic Energy Commission, really had no one watching what they did. You know, they focused building the nukes. The environmental stuff was manana or no one even thought about it. And, you know, clearly building the nukes was an unbelievably expensive venture, but so is the cleanup. And you could throw $10 billion more at Rocky Flats and you still will not make it what it was before it was there. Now, I, of course, what I said earlier, you, if Rocky Flats hadn't been there, we probably wouldn't have had that open space there. But, you know, it, I mean, it, it, I, I, I think it, Rocky Flats needed to close. Mm -hmm. So was that the good thing that came out of Rocky Flats? Was that open space or there other? Uh, <laughs> well, I guess well it's for me personally, I mean, we're, we're kind of running out of time. As I said at the start of my meeting, this would be the thing that at the end of my life I would like to say um, was the thing I'm most proud of, the small role I played. Um, and I did play a role. Um, Joe Laguerre, who is my counterpart for the Department of Energy, uh, left to go work at Idaho a few months ago. And at his going away event, he said I was a handful of, a small handful of people who played you know, was the reason the site closed. And that was quite a compliment. I don't know if it's completely accurate. I've said this to the press, and I really believe it's true, that the real heroes of Rocky Flats were the guys who wore those Michelin suits and bubble suits and went in and did the heavy lifting. Mm 
and work themselves out of a job. And in some, in some cases, don't know what they're doing now. I, three, three, four months ago, I didn't know what I was going to do where Rocky Flats is going, but I've landed my feet in this job, you know. So hopefully they are or have, will land on their feet as well. But, um, you know, as I said earlier, the most toxic thing I usually did was meetings, and some of them were pretty toxic, <laughs> both with the community and with the Department of Energy and its contractor. But I, 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 nonetheless, I'm, I am very proud of the role. I felt like I was making part of history. So in answer to your question, is the best thing that came out of Rocky Flats open space? Maybe tangibly there might be some truth to that. The best thing for me, though, is that I actually participated in something that I still marvel at, that, I, that it's gone, that, you know, that picture of all, maybe I should grab that on the wall yeah, with the camera. You ready? Yeah. But I mean, the thing that I still marvel at is the fact that this this place was what it looked like when I first arrived there um, as a you know a relative a state employee who hadn't been working for the state uh, environmental department. I hadn't even worked a year yet, but that's what it was like. And now that's all gone. There are a handful of office trailers. Um, this building, 371, the last part of it. Uh, above ground went down late last week. And to think that that's all gone is still pretty amazing to me. Um, just a couple more questions. Uh, I'm wondering, did, were there times when uh, your official role at Rocky Flats conflicted with your personal feelings about the place or the nuclear weapons or? No. Or? No, I mean, I wasn't building nuclear weapons and I wasn't involved in the decision of it. Um, you know, I was really interested in, tr I always felt like I was trying to do the right thing. You know, uh, and that may not mean what other people thought was the right thing. Because I had to balance both making certain this cleanup met, was a good cleanup in accordance with law and regulation. But I also was cognizant that you could throw, I mean, of, of the cost and, you know, the fact that as a society you have to, you, you can't throw money at everything. You, you, you had to balance cost versus effectiveness. And at some point, you, you know, um, the, how, the bang for your buck gets less and less and less is the more stringent the cleanup. Mm -hmm. So I, I, never, I never had that conflict of interest. Um, that I can think of. Um, I had some things that I knew were controversial and that the decision that I had made was controversial. Uh, an example is um, two of the buildings, uh, and I am running out of time here, two of the buildings, building 771, uh, 774, and 371, have very deep basements and these were con plutonium buildings that had contamination on the floor, particularly in on the walls, but particularly on the floor, particularly in 771. And, but there was very low level. I mean, we, they could clean it up to low levels, but to completely decontaminate it probably meant pulling up the slabs. And in some cases they had to pull up parts of the slabs, but it would have meant pulling up virtually all of the slabs. And these were massive building floors, you know, hundreds, Hundred thousand plus square feet, and um, I made, you know, as a regulator, I made the decision to allow them to not completely decontaminate those floors, because I knew that I felt the plutonium wouldn't move. Second of all, it was pretty low levels. Third of all, even if our science was wrong, we were going to have long-term groundwater monitoring. There's going to be long-term stewardship obligations around the building, so we'd see a problem long before it. Magnify, mag, you know, sh got to the streams, um, and and what I weighed against was the fact of that they, we were going to lift, you know, to to remove those slabs meant these workers wearing this full protective clothing, in respirators, um, lifting these huge pieces of concrete that weighed many many tons in a confined space, extremely dangerous. And, and I sat there thinking, well, as a regulator, what would happen if someone was crushed and killed a worker who leaves a wife and kids or whatever, a family, you know, um, and, and, and dies in something that has little or no environmental benefit? 
Um, and I could see the press. What would the press say? State Health Department forced these guys to remove this lab. Now someone's dead. There was no value. And I made the decision to that we would allow the, to remove the hotter parts. They had to scrape down the concrete and remove it to very low levels. But they didn't have to free release. They didn't have to get it down to the same level that this table would have to in order to use it at a public school or whatever. And I got a lot of heat for that. Uh, from community people and from uh, Ann Emcee with the Rocky Mountain News, she still hasn't for forgotten that. She brings it up all the time. But I know, I'm convinced that the alternative had, was not only extremely expensive, but it would it was ex the danger to the workers did not justify the environmental benefit. So I had to make d decisions like that that I think were the right decisions that um, you know, I know I took some heat for. I still do, still will. I figured one. I haven't had it happen, but I was afraid that once I, my career at Rocky Flats ended, some activist would write my epitaph saying I've caused more adverse health for future generations of Coloradans than most people. For, that hasn't happened yet, but it may still happen. Okay. Um, well, since you have to go, and I have do you to have go. one quick question? The last um, one. No, I, I'm pretty much done. I think I okay. just say, you know, anything else that you want to add or that I missed? No. Um, thanks for re recording it. I, um, I know you've done a lot of work here uh, over the years, and I think these things will be beneficial. I don't know whether the museum is going to become real or not, but I think these things are going to be real, and I'm, I'm glad I had an opportunity to lay out the story from my perspective. Well, thank you for, for doing sure. so. Sure.